also. Actually, in today's talk, I'm going to talk about uh, one of the ZK VMs that we audited um, in this in this year and the, some of the bugs that we found. Um, so yeah, <laughs> no surprise, the one that we're going to talk about is Scroll, uh, which is actually based on the PSE ZK VM. Um, so a quick uh, intro on the architecture. Um, so it's a normal ZK L2 rollup. So you send your transactions on the L2 to, let's say, the execution node. Um, it's going to generate the witness traces um, for the transactions, which will like, basically use to fill in the circuit. Um, and then it'll use that and send that to the rollup node. The rollup node commits that to chain and send this to provers. And the provers will run this huge ZK circuit, uh, prove that, and prove the correctness of the execution, and then send that to the chain. So this is a kind of the uh, architecture of the ZK EVM circuit. It's quite huge, which makes sense because EVM is quite complicated. Um, and there's a lot of components, and they all link to each other. So uh, as an as a example, let's say when you get a raw transaction, um, that transaction is encoded in the uh, recursive length prefix, RLP format. So we have a circuit that first decodes that and gets the transaction data and the call data out. Um, then that links to, let's say, the TX circuit right there. Um, the TX circuit will verify the signatures and um, other fields of the transaction um, and, and uh, extract, let's say, the addresses and the call data. And then from there, it will go into, let's say, the bytecode circuit, which will fetch the bytecode for the contract that's being called. And then, then it will go into the EVM circuit, which will do the execution. And then there's a lot of like side circuits, such as Ketchak, um, stuff for like gadgets, opcodes, things like that. So it's a, a really big interconnected system with circuits that look up into each other to get data. So the particular th uh, part of the system that we're going to focus on is based on call data. So a quick introduction. Um, so this, for example, is the raw disassembly from the USDT contract on the chain. Um, so if you know, or you might not know, how contracts get called on chain is uh, the transaction will have a two address to a contract address, and then the call data has information about what function to call. So in this case, for example, um, the, the first part of the, this is basically the first instructions that get executed. It extracts the first 20 bytes, or uh, 0x20 bytes. And then it checks the first four bytes to see what function selector is being called. So for example, here the function selector, if it's named, then it'll jump to that. And there's a huge jump table. So one can think that this something like this. Um, so the opcode that's being used is called call data load. So that has also needs to be implemented in the ZKAVM circuit. So let's see how this one gadget is implemented in the ZKAVM circuit. So we have. The f we start with the gadget, obviously, the call data load gadget. Um, it takes one argument, which is the index. So this index kind of like hooks into uh, which, which part of the call data do you want to start from. And this loads at 32 bytes at a time. So now the call data gadget on its own doesn't know anything. So it reaches out into the TX circuit or the TX table, where it will fetch, um, where it'll use the call data or the, and get that uh, 20, uh, 0x20 bytes from there. And of course, the TX circuit is, doesn't know anything about the transaction itself, so it has to verify with the RLP table or the RLP circuit, which is the raw transaction data, to make sure that the data is actually correct and like the prover hasn't put random data in there. So this is kind of what a Halo 2 a circuit uh, table looks like. So this is the uh, TX table. So as you can see, there's a lot of uh, transaction fields uh, that are common, for example, the nonce, uh, gas, uh, signatures um, and like the caller and callee address and then at the end of the table we have the call data that's appended at the end uh, now that is kind of a dynamic section because even though the first part is all static because we know that there's always going to be these fields every transaction can have a different length of call data so we kind of arrange it this way uh, uh, they arrange it this way where they put the static fields at the top and the dynamic fields at the bottom and another thing to note is there's a transaction ID. So this, this one table can support, let's say, 20 transactions or 100 transactions in a block. So the first bug that we found was that there was no check that um, the call data that's in the dynamic part of the circuit is the same as the call data from the RL, raw RLP transaction data. Um, as you remember from the first slide, those two, those two circuits were connected. And there were checks for all the other things. So you can see there's a thing called the RLP tag, which is basically what is the kind of like the location of this data in the, um, 
RLP table, and all of those things were checked, but the call data was not checked. So this was the first bug, and this is quite trivial to exploit because this means you can kind of place, what, uh, the prover can kind of place whatever data they want in that TX table and use that, and then the call data load gadget uh, will load from the TX table. So one way you could exploit this, let's see, is let's say the uh, a user sends an ERC20 transfer transaction, um, to, to like uh, the sequencer or the executor, and the call data has the to and the from fields, obviously, oh, sorry, the to and the value fields. Um, because the call data load, uh, the call data is not checked, the, they could just change this to field, and the execution will continue as if um, the transfer was made to someone else. So the fix for this bug is basically we check this, um, we compare with the RLP, tab uh, uh, RLP table and make sure that this data is correct. But one trick that um, a lot of Halo 2 circuits and even in Circom and in ZK in general we use is that instead of comparing byte by byte, so let's say if there's a thousand bytes of call data, we don't wanna have a thousand constraints that are uh, looking up across tables because that's the expensive part. So what we do is we essentially combine all of this into one number. Um, so as you can see, we uh, it's, it's, it's a little bit hard to read because it's Halo 2, but uh, we start with like call data at like the first byte and we like make a linear combination with this R value, which is a challenge. Um, so you think that is correct, but there's a, there's a subtle bug which is kind of similar to the Fiat Shamir thing that David mentioned in his talk. Um, so on the right is how it should be. So we have um, all the stuff in the TX table um, and they get uh, placed in the table, and how Halo 2 works is there's a uh, idea of phases. Um, so it's kind of like the Fiat Shamir thing or the interactive proving where you commit to a couple of uh, variables, you hash them, you get a challenge, and then you go to the next step of the process. So in, this, in the right case, for example, it should be that you first commit to all the data in the table, which is the tx.value, the nonce, and everything. You commit to that, and then you calculate the RLC based on the random hash, or what the, the, the verified challenge that is calculated based on that. But the issue here was that both the, the source and the output were on the other side. So what turned out to happen was that the prover would know the randomness value bef uh, uh, before they had to like fill in. Um, usually it should be the other way around. So what is the issue with this? Um, well, we have this equation that we kind of now need to solve. Um, so we know the value of the challenge, which is x here, before we assign the value. And we need to find some set of call data that kind of like um, satisfies this equation so that we have the RLC that we have from the RLP table, um, but we want to have some other data in there that will actually satisfy that. Um, if, if, if C were uh, allowed to be arbitrary, it would be quite trivial because you could calculate most of it and then just add one value at the end that would like make change it back. But we have a constraint here because call data is like bytes. So each value has to be in the range of uh, 0 to 256. So how we're going to do it is some magic math algorithms. Um, uh, this is, I don't have that much time to explain it. So actually, ChatGPT explains it pretty well. but. The, the, the idea is that we want to find small solutions to this equation. Um, the idea is that even though this, the size of the prime is, let's say, 2 to the power 256, we want to find small solutions like each of them has to be like less than 256. And it turns out that uh, a set of algorithms called lattice reduction algorithms uh, are very, very good at finding those. Um, so the, the idea is that we construct a set of vectors such that the space generated by this vector will contain our solution, and this lattice reduction algorithm will find one of these sh short vectors, and the vector is basically the set of call data. So how this exploit would look like in this case is like, we have, let's say, original call data, so at the top it's like, I got a ERC20 permit transaction from on-chain, I think, um, and we calculated, let's say, the challenge and the original RLC value. Um, what we can do is now is we can change, let's say, the first 64 bytes of this uh, call data to be something else. So for example, we can change this to be a transfer because the number of parameters in uh, ERC20 transfer is less than that of a permit. And in EVM, if you supply extra call data at the end of the transaction, it doesn't really care. It only reads how much it needs to. And then we have 
64 extra values that we pad at the end, uh, which we calculated from our lattice reduction algorithm uh, to kind of uh, massage the RLC to be equal to the original value. So in this case, I put just random data in there, but in theory, you could just set that to be any valid transaction. And that would pass through everything and then it would execute it. Because, because you control the first four bytes, you obviously control what function gets executed. So you kind of have this like arbitrary transaction on the contract primitive. In the real world, currently, you can't actually get anything from this because uh, for scroll and many other ZK rollups, they basically have trusted sequences and trusted provers. Um, so in this case, scroll controls all of it. Uh, obviously, if scroll wanted, they could do this because they control all parts of the chain um, with this vulnerability. Um, in theory, if um, an adversary is able to, so if we have like validator sets and we have like untrusted provers, if a, if a adversary gets control to both of those at the same time, they could generate a fake proof and like uh, update the state in an invalid way. Uh, but currently, this is safe because we trust scroll. <laughs> Um, that's it. I, I wanted to talk a little bit about what would the future be. So these days I feel like a lot of the circuits or like zero knowledge projects are basically writing very low level circuits. Um, and from industry experience we've seen that this doesn't usually lead to good security practices. Um, and a parallel I can think of is if we think about like how in traditional mission critical software we are writing in C and then C++ and now we move to Rust. Like we realize that if we write at very low level languages, it's not it's it's hard to like write secure code. So uh, we try to like add abstractions at the compiler le level so that the programmer doesn't have to think about that. Um, so I hope like our industry matures where we're not writing like low level circuits anymore and we're writing on like safe, well thought out abstractions. Thank you. That's my uh, that's that's all. Awesome, thank you so much, Sampriti. Uh, I think like uh, there's a lot to be said about how difficult it is to make something like continuity of execution, but in this case, like passing the ROP checks, I think that's pretty cool. Um, congratulations on that.